Let's discuss it with two MSNBC political analysts, Republican strategist Susan Del Percio, Democratic strategist Basil Smeichel, and NBC's Garrett Haake. So, Garrett, Midwestern nice kind of was the rule of the night for last night. Was this strategic? Yeah, it's like a couple of guys just hanging out, yeah. having a beer, talking about <laughs> politics. Yeah, I think it certainly was. Look, I mean, the first rule of vice presidential politics is to do no harm. I think both of these men showed up with that as a goal last night. Not get too far out of over their skis, not be quite as aggressive as we We've seen from either one of them when they're on the campaign trail on their own try to defend their principle and push things forward a little bit but this is sort of the extra credit debate if you're watching this last night you have probably already made up your mind and I don't think either one of these men were trying to you know kind of push things too far outside that window so Garrett is anybody playing cleanup for anything last night there's a little bit of amplification certainly happening that bite we played right at the top about uh, you know JD Vance not being able to say one way or another whether or not Donald Trump won or lost the 2020 election Democrats feel like that was Tim Walz's best moment they want to try to really highlight that and continue to push that forward. I think Vance is going to have some questions he have to, has to answer, particularly his answer about Obamacare last night, where he basically gave a, a fan fiction answer about what Donald Trump tried to do with Obamacare. I covered Capitol Hill during that period. J.D. Vance's answer had almost nothing to do with the reality of that moment. I think he's going to continue to get pressed on that today. But so far right now, the Trump uh, people that I talk to feel very good about Vance. They feel like that's the guy they put on the ticket for this reason, and he delivered. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that moment there between uh, Vance and walls on the issue of the 2020 election. Let's listen to what part of that conversation was like. He is still saying he didn't lose the election. I would just ask that. Did he lose the 2020 election? Tim, I'm focused on the future. Did Kamala Harris censor Americans from speaking their mind in the wake of the 2020 COVID situation? That is, a damning, to, that is a damning non-answer. He lost the election. This is not a debate. It's not, it, it, it's not anything anywhere other than in Donald Trump's world. Because look, when Mike Pence made that decision to certify that election, that's why Mike Pence isn't on this stage. What I'm concerned about is, where is the firewall with Donald Trump? So then how did Vance answer that question? I mean, there's also the basic seat, oh, no, but that wasn't a part of the equation. Well, factually, he handled it horribly. I mean, that was not an answer. He, he, but he knew what he had to say because he was speaking to an audience of one. Any Trump van supporter already knows where the former president stands on that. And so he was speaking to Donald Trump. I actually think the fallout for Vance may be more about Donald Trump being a little jealous that someone had a better debate night than he mm. did and may not be so happy to let it end there. So... We can see what happens. So it's always what the voters think, right? And that's what really matters as we're already starting to have early voting happening in parts of the country. One middle of the road Pittsburgh voter told us this about that 2020 exchange. What really bothered me was how J.D. Vance pivoted the question and turned it into, you know, really defended Donald Trump's position on January 6th. And the fact that he, he wouldn't, he, he tried to avoid the answer. Basil, was that moment important for the Harris campaign when it comes to undecided voters? Well, I think it was because, look, if you look at Tim Walz's good part, the parts of his performance last night that were really good, it was on child care, it was on reproductive rights, it was on January 6th, the answer that you just heard. Those are the areas where Democrats really have the ability to mobilize their voters. And it also points to the fact that uh, of how much Donald Trump's campaign strategy relies on believing that he did not lose the election to Joe Biden. That an election denialist sort of campaign strategy is really central to what Donald Trump is doing. So Democrats, yes, can go to their voters and hammer that home because the, what it does is remind undecideds in particular that if he continues on this path of trying to deny uh, not only the 2020 election victory of Joe Biden, but sow the seeds of doubt for the 2024 election, there's a potential for more violence. There's a potential for more chaos. So as long as Democrats can continue to remind voters of that, uh, I do think it's a, it was a really important point last night. Susan, the abortion issue did come up last night, and it was interesting to hear how these two men on uh, the debate stage handled this issue. Let's listen. My party, we've got to do so much better of a job at earning the American people's trust back on this issue where they frankly just don't trust us. There's a young woman named Amber Thurman 
She happened to be in Georgia, a restrictive state. Because of that, she had to travel a long distance to North Carolina to try and get her care. Amber Thurman died in that journey back and forth. The fact of the matter is, how can we as a nation say that your life and your rights, as basic as the right to control your own body, is determined on geography? There's a very real chance, had Amber Thurman lived in Minnesota, she would be alive today. So, Susan, it's one thing for Republicans to say they need to earn back the trust of what a funny women word. voters, <laughs> but, I mean, have they taken any action to actually get that trust? No. As a matter of fact, Vance lied during that debate on an, the issue of a national abortion ban. So, no, J.D. Vance using the word trust is completely laughable. What was important, I think, for the Harris Walls campaign was seeing a man for the first time on that kind of national stage talk about the importance of reproductive rights and where we are post row. So I, I think that really helped the campaign a lot, speak to a certain segment of the population, maybe independent men who just can kind of get their arms around the fact that this is their issue too. You know, Basil, one of the things that um, I noticed is, is the insistence on the recurrence of Senator Vance turning again and again to the issue of immigrants or migrants and blaming migrants from from everything from the cost of housing crowded schools there's the whole springfield the eating cats and dogs i mean it's almost like a constant issue that he brought in regardless of what the debate question was about what is this geared towards well to susan's point He's really got an audience of one, and that's Donald Trump. Actually, he's got he's got two. He's got Donald Trump today, and he's got the future of the Republican Party that he's looking forward to. In other words, he's trying to audition to be the sort of heir apparent, if you will, to what Trumpism is today. Because Trump is not going to be whether he's president next year. Oh, I hope he's not president after today, after this year. But wh whatever happens to Donald Trump, J.D. Fans is poised to be the future of the party. So he's sort of using this moment to. And this platform to showcase that. But in order to get to that point, he's got to show fealty to Donald Trump, which means repeat everything that Donald Trump is saying. Just do it better <laughs> than he did, but he's got to repeat everything Donald Trump is saying. All of, all of what he's discussing, the, 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 the harsh conversations about immigrants, uh, talking about uh, reproductive rights in a way, and still repeating the election denialism, all of that is meant to just be food for the base, because he's going to have to go back to that base should he have a future in the party. Garrett, one of the key constituents constituency groups of the voter electorate this year is the younger vote. Mm -hmm. And we checked in with some college voters, college age voters, and one took issue with an answer related to uh, tying everything back to Kamala Harris and the Biden administration and trying to really tie her to President Biden's actions in office. Take a listen. If anybody took high school civics class, they'd know what the vice president can do and what the vice president can do. I want to make a quick point. Neither candidate on that stage talked about what executive action they're going to take on day one to do what they want, nor were they asked, because they know that they can't. That's not how the vice presidency works. You don't get to do what you want. You do what the president delegates you to do. Oh. He's telling it like it is, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it gets into the issue, though, of who the incumbent in this race is, right? Yeah, I mean, this is such an unusual race because you functionally do have two incumbents running against each other. You don't get to judge presidential record against presidential record here. With Harris, it's this interesting dynamic where the Trump campaign wants to make her own everything voters don't like about the Biden administration, but also try to prevent her from taking credit from everything that they might like about it. It's a very difficult tightrope that Harris has to walk, but... It, it creates this dynamic where it's a throw the bums out election, but behind the other door, there's just another bum, right? right? There's just somebody else who's already had this job. How the two campaigns handle incumbency, I think, between now and the, the month that we have left, 34 days, if you're counting at home, uh, is going to be one of the major deciding factors. Gary, I want to ask you a question that Susan kind of brought up yeah. on the issue of the debate last night and whether it had any impact or influence on the former president deciding not to do any more debates. You, the cover, the Trump campaign, do you think that there's any added pressure or any 
issues going on now because of last night? I don't have any new reporting on this, but I have long been in the camp that Donald Trump will not want someone else to have the last word about this campaign for him. I think if this race is close or if he thinks he's behind, he has always believed he's his own best spokesperson, and I wouldn't slam the door on a debate until the very last possible minute.